Hello and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place where we share creative and inspiring learning in our schools. Season 4, Episode 60. Hello and welcome back to the Education on Fire podcast with me, Mark Taylor. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Sue Nichols, who is an education specialist, music education specialist, um, who I first came across actually at a conference in Northamptonshire as part of my music teaching there, um, and then came across again um, in Manchester earlier this, or last year now, in 2017, um, who was there delivering um, some workshops and and some real great insight into primary music and and what can be done um, within the primary sector. So thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Lovely to be here. Can we start with a little bit of history? I know you were a primary teacher before and and, and, and now, as you say, you're an independent educator. So how did your sort of history and your journey take you to where you are now? Right. Well, back in the 14th century, when I trained, you know, with slates and so on, um, I began as a, as you say, as a specialist in primary schools. I've worked in schools all around the country, tiny schools and big schools, and usually as the music specialist, sometimes as the art specialist. And then... In the last kind of 12 years, um, a new status emerged, the advanced skills teacher status, which I really decided was for me because it would give me a chance to go and work with other teachers, um, generalists. And that was a very, very happy time. So um, that was kind of one of the big landmarks. I also started delivering workshops years ago. I don't know how it happened. It was just one of those kind of invited things. And I found that I really enjoyed teaching other people, helping, supporting and creating resources. So the songwriting, the resource books, the publication all came about. So that has always been very interesting. Then about 11 years ago, I decided that music was even more important than phonics and literacy and maths. And I decided to go freelance, um, which would allow me to work in all kinds of spheres of music education. I've been involved since then in teacher training. I have worked with publishers. I've led conferences all kinds of areas. Sing Up, of course, was a very large part of it. And this is now ongoing. This is now the 11th year, and I still seem to be inundated with work. <laughs> um, so when you were um, a classroom teacher, um, how did music fit is, is part of that? Was it um, a heavy influence because that was what you were really interested in as, as well as the sort of the global teaching that you have to do? Or, or was it something you were asked to do and something you grew into? Or wh- wh- Where is the history of the music being so important? Well, at Teach Training College, which is what I um, where I trained, uh, music was my main specialism. And of course, when I went for a new job, teachers would see that you could play the piano and the recorder and so on. So A, it was one of those kind of imposed things. But I've always loved it. It's just seemed to me one of the most natural of the arts forms. It speaks to every child. It's a universal language. Um, And so many children are not necessarily academically inclined. Music was for them a release, an emotional um, platform. Um, It's just been wonderful. Um, Of course, when I first started teaching, resources were pretty lean. And I found that I was actually inventing them, which was a very useful thing for me it made me write songs it made me invent rhythm games it helped me to make up a music scheme in the end so that's where it all stemmed from and it's just grown and grown and grown and that's often where the best resources come from you develop them for the children that you're working with and things that you know work because the experience that you have from doing it you find out what works and what doesn't and and and, and what what are the sort of the key elements of those things that you've developed that why do they seem to work for, for children and, and ones that you may have developed don't work so well. What, what, what's the sort of the important part of that? I think knowing your audience is really useful. And I've always listened to uh, Tony Knight always said, do something simple, but do it well. So I've never attempted to produce Grease with Year 4. <laughs> it's always been, perhaps sometimes even under an appropriate level for the children, but something that you could then develop and help them embellish and grow. So it's always been a manageable resource. Um, I've used things very much in cross-curricular vein. So if we're doing the Vikings, we would do some pulse work on rowing. Um, If we were doing the Greeks, um, we would make up weaving songs for, you know, arachnid and so on. It's always been embedded in my primary practice deeply and never a bolt-on. 
and I think that cross curricular thing is certainly in my experience of when I've been doing things within schools it it just that that embeddedness of it all so it's mm-hmm. not kind of now we're doing music and now we're doing this and now we're doing that an integral part of how you're learning and as you said some children have a, an affinity with music in a way that means that they can still within the subject they're learning find find their skill and find their sort of niche and and, and their sort of positivity from that and also from as a sort of philosophical strand life isn't divided into areas called geography and history no. and music should be running like a thread right through everything i actually hate the expression music supporting other subjects i like to think of it as being an equal partnership um, or a fusion but yes it should be in everything i don't think i taught one area of the curriculum without music maths english particularly english art it was always integrated and i have to say whenever ofsted came to a school where i was teaching they loved it so i think i was getting something right I think that's a really important point is is that actually when these things are embedded when they're part and parcel of what you do Ofsted always love what it is that's going on it's not about the tick boxing we've covered this it's the fact if you've just got a really vibrant specifically mu- music and and the arts within your school you would have taken care of anything which was is or was related to the national curriculum within that and more you know yes absolutely the other thing i found it uh, particularly the last scholar was that i've always had a strong adherence to music theater you know performing dance the whole bit and uh, locally to the school i was at we have a castle just up the road here and at my school, we were given the chance to use this wonderful Vambra Hall in the castle. So every year we put on an opera, she says in inverted commas. But it meant that I wrote the score um, and my children were the star actors, if you like. But we matched up with the local grammar school who brought their grade eight and grade seven players to be in the orchestra with our place. It was very much a cross phase uh, development. And what was so lovely was that I had just as many boys wanting to dance and sing solos and play instruments as girls. And it became a real ambition for pupils moving up the school to see that they would be part of this performance and this production. Yeah, and I think that progression is really important, isn't it? And also, like you say, between different schools Mm -hmm. and, and the community at large to feel like it's actually... I don't know, it it gives you that sort of idea that it's more than just about your classroom. It's actually much more about life itself and also how, as you say, you're going to grow in as you get older as well. And I think for our year five and six children to see the grade eight, um, year 12s and 13s, see that progression, see where they could go with it. And actually that they weren't just being treated as little primary children, they were being part of a band, an orchestra with these older ones. Yes, I think that that's joined up thinking is so important and so lacking at the moment. I think that's very true. So... If we go right back to nursery, um, early years, um, what's the sort of um, music in, and the sorts of games and the sorts of things that you'd encourage teachers to do? And especially if they're not very um, established as a music teacher or very confident in what they're doing, what's the sort of thing that they can do practically which actually would really start to sort of embed that within, mm. within their class without it actually feeling like it's too far removed from yes. their comfort zone? Well, certainly nursery rhymes are a very good starting point and many young mums don't know them. So that's always good. And if people feel, I can't sing, I sound like a corncrake, there is this wonderful YouTube mechanism. There are CDs. Um, You can use that to support your own singing. I also think anything that gets children moving to the beat, it might be simple clapping, tapping the ground, stamping your feet, walking around in a circle, very simple ideas like that. And um, also finding songs that have a very, limited range of notes some people will go and play a cd and it's a very very complicated song recognize that you want very simple material repetitious um cuckoo notes that kind of da, 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 is really a useful concomitant of any song you want to do with nursery and also exploration children need to find out what the timbre of instruments and sound makers are you know running canes on the railing outside in the outdoor area, having a box of junk and letting them make cardboard drums and so on. Very important because as they get older, that exploration, that golden holistic time is reduced and reduced because of the demands of the curriculum. But actually having that exploration and playing and bashing about, really important, you know, unfettered. Yes, and I, and I really like that with the music because it's such a creative thing and yet a lot of the curriculum and, and with the music as well now is kind of a, it needs to be good. We need to have a polished performance. We need to have that. And you know, th- there's a certain amount of skill within that which is important, but that creativity of just let's see what this sounds mm. like. Let's see how we can put it together. Does this work together? Do yeah. we think it works together or not? And and the other thing I really liked about what you said is the repetition mm. is the fact that you know we don't do our two times table and then we never do it again to a three. It's the using it over and over and over again and having a, a structure whether it's a rhythm game or, or a nursery that you do regularly which just gives people confidence doesn't it and like you say you can expand a lot of yes. that and f- from there 
I mean, just taking simple songs and changing one word, and if you're singing a song about a giraffe, you can, it can be a frog the next week. And letting children have that autonomy too. There's a great deal talked about autonomy in early years, and I think that's true. It is their own guided learning. Um, taking a, a stretchy lyric sheet and bouncing a frog rhythmically and singing a song means that the children in their own uh, time will go and find that piece of fabric and find that frog and replicate it for themselves. I think that's very important. I don't see how you can ask a year three or four child to choose instruments their composition if they've not been through that process of knowing that something with little bumps along it will make a scraping noise and a, something with beads inside will make shaking noise it's really important to have that fundamental exploration and do you think as the children move through the years as well do you use the same type of material and just sort of upscale it in, in, in into what they're doing you said sort of topic based you know that it become more thing but would you use the same for example the same nursery rhyme but just change the words or, or would you make the, the rhythm games maybe that you do just a bit more complicated or do you, is there a bit more development than oh that? i'm i'm a great believer in progression uh, um acquisition of musical skills and the experimentation. No, I don't use the same material going on. I mean, sometimes it's appropriate to do so, but I like to build in new skills and new uh, musical concepts. Um, there's a very wonderful document produced by the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham called Minimum Expected Standards, which is the whole music curriculum broken down to little steps, very easy to follow. Uh, so a child who has got the pulse and you know, can mark a pulse really now needs to develop some rhythmic confidence Mm -hmm. to be able to make up rhythms matched to syllables or whatever so I'm very much a believer in keeping a structure and a progressive pathway because otherwise it's rather like teachers who teach the Romans in year two and then the next teacher used to teach the Romans in year three we've got over that now because of the national curriculum but in music unskilled teachers do need a structure and I suppose that's where music schemes like Charanga and Music Express will really help them to find that progression I think that's important otherwise we're in stasis we can't sing you know um, Bar Bar Black Sheep in year six there is a certain sort of peer pressure not to yes and 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 you mentioned Taranga and those sorts of things that there are some fantastic resources out there that, that can really support teachers have you got some some favorites or or is it really i mean having sort of spoken to to people within these organizations it does seem to me that it's the bank in the wealth of songs mm. and, and music they've got within mm. them which is if you've just got an, enough of an idea of where you want to head you can find what you need now because it's all available I think that music schemes now are pretty refined um, and it really depends the approach you want. I mean, Charanga is very popular. It starts off with a piece or a song, often very cool and hip, and kids love it. I mean, I've seen a class kind of roaring away with Eye of the Tiger and so on. Um, I think Music Express is also, particularly the new revised one, I don't know if teachers are aware that it's now in its second edition, and Whereas I think the old edition was quite tricky in the top end of the junior school. This one is very accessible. And if it asks you to ask the children a question, it puts the answer in brackets so you don't look a prune in front of your class. Yeah. Um, I think Sing Up is a great resource now and it's really joined up. It's got early years. It now goes into secondary. And it's not just songs. I don't know if people realise that there are whole units of work taking a song as the springboard right through into music units of work and some lovely care of the voice videos uh, really good teaching notes good magazine i think that's an excellent resource um i could go on citing books after books after books if singing is what something that teachers want to develop i think the voice work series is superb um very carefully graded lots of support how to do the warm-ups and lovely cd recordings you can use um but there's really no excuse now for a generous not to try one of the schemes rather than say i can't do music and just kind of forget about it um there's enough support mechanisms there like you say literally if you're literally learning with the children and and, I, and also I quite like that as well they're, they're not kind of you need to know everything in advance oh. you know d do it together yes. and and certainly from from my samba workshops that I've done the most successful ones are always when the the class teachers in the circle when we start with the children you know we're doing this together you don't know this we can learn it together yes. and, and that's really really an important I think role that's I think. absolutely crucial as we discussed earlier the arts generally are subjects where you have to be involved in the action in the doing in the learning drama dance music it really is you can't do it all from a whiteboard and I think for young teachers a lot of them feel quite insecure dabbling but if as you say they treat themselves as a learner with the children they'll find the joy in it and also gain some skills hopefully absolutely and and the and in this sort of current um society within education of needing 
feedback and and being able to quantify what it is that these people have been able to do it's harder to do within music in the arts but actually in other ways it's much easier because when the parents and the staff are watching children perform mm. you actually uh, you're invested and you're with them doing it yes. you, you know whether you can put a number on it or not is kind of immaterial the fact is is that you can feel that mm. what they've gained and what they've learned is something which you is so in really important to their general well-being mm. as well as their Absolutely. education well it's immersive and it's engaging and it's spiritual if you like and it's um, holistic, isn't it? I mean, the whole body sings when you sing and when you play an instrument, you're part of it. It's um, And as we know, music learning makes both hemispheres of the brain light up with neural pathways. So we're actually making learning more likely to happen. I mean, there's just every justification for getting involved in the arts. And when I'm queen, it's going to be compulsory <laughs> <laughs> every day. So sort of mo- moving on, let, let's uh, let's assume that um, a teacher listening, that they've decided on a scheme they want to do. And, and lots of the resources that we talked about I'll have on the show notes um, mm-hmm. um, of this episode. So how do they then progress from there? You know, I've talked before about, you know, is a recorders, is that the next step or an ocarina or, or, or do you no, now I need an orchestra? You know, how do, you, how do you see that sort of progression is? Well, I think obviously very much down to individual confidence and um, ambition, if you like. Um, often, or well, in most schools now, there are at least one class is having whole class instrumental tuition provided by the hub. Yeah. And then there is a continuation package for those children who want to do it. Um, that means that every child as they pass through the school will get that bank of um, input on an instrument. If teachers wish to try other instruments, I think that's laudable and desirable. I've always had recorder ensembles in every school I've had, but I'm of an age where the recorder was kind of a de rigueur, really. Um, the Ocarina is a brilliant, absolutely brilliant instrument. David Liggins of Northampton will be thrilled to hear me say it because it requires just two fingers on each hand and thumbs to operate and children with learning um, special needs um, can manage it. It's cheap. It's, uh, I say, cheap and cheerful. And the joy is that when you overblow an ocarina, it doesn't make any noise at all. So you've um, <laughs> achieved many things. I think introducing children to instruments is excellent. It's for dexterity, for tuning, for listening by ear, playing by ear, improvising. Um, If the wicket lessons are going to use instrumental, um, sorry, orchestral instruments really, then obviously the teacher who is going to try to do other things will not be aiming for that. But ocarinas, recorders, you can have glockenspiel clubs. That works very, very well, chime bars. It's it's just an expansion, isn't it? And you are giving, therefore, children uh, an extra bite of the cherry, letting them play as well as sing and play the school instruments. I think it's a grand idea. It's not for everyone, though, and I think you've got to just allow that poor music coordinator who might have her own class and not actually get her hands on any other children in the school for music lessons. You've just got to sort of do what works. But there's an awful lot out there, and and the... um, Ukulele is another great favourite. Yes, of course. Especially the pink ones, I believe. Um, (laughs) So there are many quite reasonably priced uh, instruments that catalogues will sell in bulk. So yes, I think it's a grand idea. And and you mentioned the music hubs, and they're really important, aren't they? I mean, I've talked quite a lot in previous episodes about the fact the partnership idea is really important. Like you say, the music coordinator often has their own class and time is limited. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of their job often now is just coordinating and just sort of setting things in yeah. place. And you need the music hubs, you need the people coming in, doing the, mm-hmm. the whole class stuff to, to, yes. to give you that extra dimension. Well, as I said before, Joined Up Thinking is the name of the game. The hub have offers of training, they have um, their instrumental teachers and they have also networks so um, teachers in a very large county can actually have small clusters which the hub will kind of facilitate Um, there's training from the hubs as instrumental teachers I also think the buddy system you know a coordinator in one school who is um, more confident more experienced can support a new or a generalist we do a lot of that sort of buddying system And as you say, a coordinator who runs music in school who is not a specialist will need the hub to provide that backup. I mean, hubs now often very, very good conferences uh, that are just as much for the generalist as the specialist. Lots of workshops, lots of ideas for supporting. Um, Lots of uh, us consultants go around giving um, support to individual schools through hubs because sometimes a coordinator just can't get out to a conference or to CPD. But someone can go in and give that um, support. I think joined 
end up thinking is really important, particularly as hubs now have to take on teacher training responsibility. Absolutely. So can we take both of those options? First of all, in terms of, of the sorts of things you would do if you were going into an individual school and, and the sorts of things that you can offer and, and, and how music coordinators and schools can actually get what they need, mm. depending on where they're starting. And then secondly, like you say, about being able to go to a conference and the sorts of things mm. that are available and the sorts of places they can go for that. Well, when I go into an individual school, I go as, really as a sort of ambassador and from the hub I've been sent. And it can be anything. I've had sort of NQTs who are just about to take on music responsibility, who don't even know where the percussion is. I went to one school um, with a percussion trolley where the maracas were actually light bulbs covered with papier mache, and then it was dry, they were smashed. So, plenty of work on practical levels. Um, Often the coordinator will want to look at schemes and I always take copies of schemes or show them online schemes. I show them other resources. I show them how they might set up a choir, what a choir rehearsal can look like. Um, we talk about um, how to assess children in very simple and practical and straightforward terms, how to make music an assessment area just as they would in maths and English. Um, we also talk about how to support their colleagues. Now, if you've got recalcitrant teachers as colleagues who don't want to do music, it's still your job as coordinator to get them on board. I suggest that they pinch 10 minutes out of every weekly staff meeting with the head support and teach them a simple rhythm game. They can find them in books, they can find them on courses, but just something to get teachers involved, realising that it's not scary, it's not esoteric, that you can do something with your children. That way, I think, is really useful. I also encourage coordinators to talk to coordinator in a neighbouring school, particularly if they're more experienced, and obviously to look at things like the ISM webinars, um, which is all about how you might develop your music in your school. There are lots and lots of uh, ways. In terms of conferences, they are fantastic, I think, primarily for the networking. Coordinators meet up. They might not be geographic near each other. But suddenly, they find they've got the same problem to face, or they've got the difficult head, or they've got no money, or whatever it is. And it's a good moan time. Yep. That sounds very negative, but actually it's very therapeutic. Then most conferences will offer a range of workshops. Um, some are purely practical. Come and do welly dancing. Come and learn the ocarina. Come and find out how to introduce two parts singing. Really practical areas. Others are more research-based. You know, really how how and why are we assessing? Um, it might be how we know that early language is developed by singing. So you get this wonderful range and of course you can choose. Often you get this horrible choice of the two things you want to go to being on at the same same time but I would absolutely recommend Music Mark fantastic your local hub conference go to as much CPD as you can and if money is a problem um, go and talk to your um, chair of governors because the governors are there to support you and maybe they can find a few pennies to pay for you to go and do something like that and and I think with the internet, like you say, often the people that you meet somewhere like that, you will then be able to connect with. And it's not a one-off conversation on that day. It's a relationship that you start and, and the support you can get ongoing from there on in is a really integral part of your development as well. Absolutely. And I've often overheard one coordinator saying, I use this book, it's brilliant. And if you go to page 42 and you'll see the other person writing it down and you know that they're going to connect and match up. Yes, I think it's, it's um, very important particularly in some Lincolnshire where I live, some very small isolated rural schools. And without that connection with other people, it's so easy to let that subject drift and drop. So I think networking is key at all levels. And I think the fact that, like you say, other teachers are your best teacher. It, it's that, because it, especially if you're sort of starting out and I want to create this whole thing, it's, it can be really daunting. But just that, well, when I did year one, I used this book and so, I used yes, this thing. And you'll use it to begin with and you'll find that it works for you or it doesn't. But then you'll find something else. And it's just allowing, the, I guess, embracing the journey, which I always like because that's exactly what the children yeah. are on as well. Yeah. Learning new things and seeing Absolutely. how it develops and you keep the stuff that works and you change the stuff that doesn't. In the Certificate for Music Educators, of which I run a centre nationally, there are lots of other centres, They um, each candidate has to form an action plan. And one mandatory strand in the action plan that we ask people to do is to go and do some partnership work with a buddy or a nearby school to actually work with somebody and learn through that tandem to develop your own skills. And they embrace that very fondly, so it's it's obviously working. Absolutely. And and tell me a little bit more about the, the teacher training side of your work and, and, and how all of that's developing. Well, it's um, by invitation, which is rather 
nice. Um, I've wor- I work at one university at the moment. I have worked at two. And this is on the PGCE uh, music module. This is for generalist teachers and they get two hours. But um, when the national plan came out, one of its recommendations was that teacher trainees at the end of training were offered intensive modules for those with musical competence. And Northampton took this on and bless them, they have continued this for seven years. I think other institutions did not. So I regularly have 25 or so end of year, end of training students in year threes or PGCEs and they come for four intensive modules and we do everything right from the theory and the practice, the planning, the playing, personal music skills, the whole caboodle. So that's one aspect and I cherish that because it's just wonderful to see these new music teachers going off, you know, flying away into their new careers. The other strand, the Certificate for Music Educators, has been out for about five years. Um, Trinity um, were the original source, I believe others will uh, be validation centres, but it's happening all over the country and um, there are different kinds of centres. Some will take people with quite um, low-level skills, music and educationally, and bring them on over two years. The course I run is a fast-track one, which is for people with musical competence and some experience of working in schools, so that in a sense we're kind of crystallising everything they do and just tweaking it and honing it and making it better. And I think, truthfully, Mark, the CME may well be the future of music educators in our education system because only three universities now are running designed music specialist teacher training courses so I think the CME is going to start flooding our schools hopefully with lots of well-trained music educators I hope so and 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 also like you said about people coming into the profession when they're slightly older maybe they've retired from um, working in the forces or something like mm. that but they have a musical background hopefully their passion if they do come into the profession will really sort of revitalize music within the schools as well because you have people that are in in the heart of what they're about yeah. mu- music's music's really important and i think it needs someone like that within the school for that to kind of change within mm. the system at the moment absolutely i mean anyone with musical competence who's interested in developing children's musicality are the people we want we want that passion and that drive and their skill and their enthusiasm because um it's not always going to be the QTS teacher who has that skill, but maybe this new wave of CME candidates is going to really start infiltrating our system and bringing more children to more music. Bring it on. Yeah, absolutely. And the confidence thing is really important. And, and the one thing I loved about the first workshop that we did together, um, or rather I was participating in that you were leading, was you very quickly got everyone involved. It was very hands-on. It was very... Um, inclusive. Mm. What are some of the practical skills that you do that uh, as an educator that you can pass on to the people listening just to maybe either help them be a bit more confident or like you say if there are other members of staff that they're trying to encourage to, um, to be that way just to get them sort of off their chair and yes. taking part um, from the start really? Just I mean really almost anything. I mean simple passing a clapping pulse around the, the circle, some stamping, singing, Often comic songs, actually. Something with a bit of humour that makes people smile and relax their tight facial muscles will do wonders. There are all kinds of resources out there. There's one online you can find, completely free, called Singing Breakfast Clubs, which was originated by Sing Up um, with Continue. Continue no longer continues. Right. <laughs> but um, it's available and it's full of simple little songs and raps, all to tunes you know. Using tunes you know is a great handle for people who don't read music. And it's full of very engaged attractive simple things with pulse patterns clapping call and response um, echo echo songs and echo games are fabulous because you're not asking the learner to do anything difficult other than watch and do exactly what you do you know parrot fashion if you like but it means that people can gain some simple skills through very very simple activities Um, I'm a great believer in getting up and doing things I can't bear doing um, keynotes where we all sit on our chairs and look solemn mine are all get up and talk to the person next door or sing to the person next door I think Music is essentially a practical. It has its rigour, it has its intellectual aspects, but actually it's about engaging and doing it and practical. And that's what I do all my educational practice through. And and I think feeling confident is important, isn't it? And, and I'm, I'm with you. A lot of the rhythm games I do when I'm t- doing samba, mm. um, the rhythms are really important. Um, yes. We're doing it together. So there's, there's not the essence of you've got to do something on your own at no. the very beginning. Mm. The questions I ask are things like, say your name, well, you know your name, or say your favourite colour, well, you know that. So you 
you're not you, you can't get it wrong which then gives you the yeah. confidence and very quickly within a few minutes or certainly in a few weeks if you've got a, a, a lot of a lot of weeks that you can work with them they want to be doing more yeah. difficult things because they suddenly feel confident enough and they, they don't mm. feel that they can get it wrong whatever their version is or whatever their ideas are that comes across are going to be right and it's embraced by everybody absolutely yes absolutely and often people will turn up to a class or a workshop and say the first thing they say is are you going to make me sing on my own as if you would I mean you never put anybody into that position you do it all together and you also make it a climate in which making a mistake and I don't believe in mistakes but you know clapping in the offbeat or whatever it is yeah. is just all part of it it's just part of the game it's part of the fun and part of the learning and that you're going to make the first mistake anyway I mean you play heads shoulders knees and toes with children you know you're the one who's going to sing heads in the wrong place and they'll all laugh and that's great I think that's really important that we don't make music something where it's not okay to make a mistake don't like mistake or it's it's okay to be experimental to get egg all over your face i think that's all part of it as with all learning actually not yeah it, it, it reminds me of something i used to do with um it was, i started it in, in nursery classes when i was doing this whole whole class um work in, in the school in london um and it was very much that the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to you're just going to copy what i'm doing and i'd mm. literally point to different yes. parts of my body um i'd make silly noises yes. which of course they really liked and i used to finish it off by doing head shoulders knees and toes without saying anything and just that sudden sudden yes. familiarity they sort of, they, you see their eyes light up and they think oh i know this this is part of what mm. already in my in my understanding and then yes. i do something silly mm. of, of part of the phrase that they you could hear in their mind they were singing the song and then I do something daft which they'd love and and it is just that building up of confidence I think. Mm. I think also when it comes to things like using percussion a lot of uh, non-specialists will say well I don't know its name and I don't know what it does well forget that just get some sets of sticks everybody has a pair of sticks and you do some copying games some tapping games bang on the chair legs I use a lot of plastic upturned buckets because they're cheap and cheerful and people have them and it it's kind of reduces that barrier to learning and I think a lot of people see music as esoteric and and that it's full of these barriers and hurdles you have to jump over and I think reducing that is really really important um like improvising making up sounds to go with the story so what would Cinderella what would the noises Cinderella have to make when she's doing the hard work can we make some sweeping sounds and um, can we make some doing the laundry on the stones in the river what would it sound like when the messenger comes with a letter banging on the door do you think you could find a sound and it makes it so much more accessible I think accessible is a big part of my kind of philosophy of music learning i think that's it it's using what you have it's using the knowledge you have and as you said find someone who can help you if you want to progress and there's other things local schools hubs all of those things around there and just develop at your own pace and if you're led by the children they'll often tell you the sorts of things they're like you'll see what they're enjoying mm. and just go with it and keep it fun yeah. and and from there i think yeah i think you'll musical life in a school's got a really bright future. Absolutely. Um, Alison Dorban has just written a marvellous book called um, Music in the Primary School. Very accessible. And her whole mantra all the way through is, just have a go. It doesn't matter. Have a go. Bring some joy. Bring some music to this children, but have a go at it. Don't expect the moon. Just try something out and watch the joy on their faces. And that couldn't be a better maxim for anybody, could it? Absolutely. And that's a perfect place to end because if we can uh, in achieve that in every single classroom, <laughs> then we're going to have a lot of very happy and well-educated children, I think. So. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation there with Sue Nichols. Um, she's very kindly said that if you want to get in contact with her, then you can just email me, mark at educationonfire.com, and I can put you in touch. And she has a myriad of resources, and there's some amazing insights that she can come to your school and share, should that be something you'd like. So contact me, mark at educationonfire.com, and I'll put you in touch. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.